good deal. Um, okay, so again, I want to reintroduce everybody. I thought everything was live and it wasn't, so it's my fault. Um, my name is Chris Kane with Knoxville Youth Athletics. I'm the president and I uh, want to quickly introduce, reintroduce our athletes here again. Um, first, we have Erica Kemp, who is a uh, NC State athlete, uh, multi, uh, multiple time All American there, and moved on to professional career now in Boston with Team BAA. And um, next, we have Johnny Gregoric, who's a uh, mile athlete and a uh, uh, graduate from Columbia and University of Oregon, and now um, uh, running for ASICS, uh, proudly wearing his shirt there and um, uh, running for New Jersey, New York Track Club. If Aaron Templeton, a uh, local athlete, graduated from Hardin Valley Academy, went on to Furman, had success, and now is running for, um, uh, running for 10 Men Elite and Adidas. And then we have Ellie Perrier, who is graduated from University of New Hampshire and is a uh, mile athlete uh, who just set the American record indoors, running 416 and uh, runs for New Balance Boston. Um, we also have a guest in here, uh, Todd Williams, who is a, an Olympian. And the uh, reason I brought him in is um, Erica got her big race at the USATF 15K Championships um, in 2019. And Todd is the longstanding men's record holder at the Gate River Run in Jacksonville, Florida. And I just wanted him to quickly kind of re-summarize um, what that race meant to you and how that race helped you know that have the confidence to move forward into bigger events. You know, for the Gate Run to me, you know, it became a national championship in 1994. So it was a, uh, at that time, it was a, a huge thing for a race, especially at the 15K distance to become a national championship. So, you know, I, I trained extremely hard for that race and, and I wanted to win a national title. So when I went there in 94 for the inaugural national championship, it was a, it was a great confidence booster for me to win a national championship there. Um, and then in 95, when I set the American record, uh, you know, the race taught me that, you know, don't waste, don't waste time and don't waste your fitness level. You know, I, I was extremely fit that year. The weather conditions were perfect and uh, the gun went off and I just ran as hard as I could run. And I really didn't worry about anyone else. So I think that race gave me the confidence going into international competition, not to be afraid and just push myself as hard as I could possibly push and not worry about anybody else. Um, as far as having the American record for, 25 years. I never thought it would last this long, but you know, I, I don't want anybody to break it. That's for sure. I want to keep yeah, I was talking earlier. About Everybody goes, hey. I was talking earlier about your um, uh, post, uh, post, uh, post every day, your workouts leading up to that to that race, and some of those workouts are just stupid. What you're running, um, and I liked your recap this week of your relationship with Bob Kennedy and and the the mile workout y'all did in Indiana. That was <laughs> pretty, pretty stupid. But um, Erica, do you have any advice maybe for Erica as she moves forward um, and maybe how that 15K distance or uh, can help propel her to, to future success out there in the 5K, 10K, or maybe even higher? You know, I think, I think everyone on this panel, you know, I think we're all in the kind of, you know, in the same boat, you know, I'm retired, but I think the people that are in, at the professional level and distance running, they know what they need. It's just, it's not really going to be a river run or any particular race. It's just working extremely hard. You know, when I did some of my hard work in my logs, you know, I kept logs from 1983 until 2002. And, um, you know, it's just a lot of hard work, but it's fun. You know, I think being a professional runner and being able to do what you love, getting up every day and being able to hammer and doing hard workouts and challenging yourself. Those are the things that, you know, you know, for the young bucks, for everybody that's young on this panel, don't waste one second. Just get out, get after it, and and when you're fit, you know, take care of business. And and I think Gate River Run or wherever it is, just keep hammering and, and enjoy the process because it goes by like that, and then you're going to be old like me, and then you're going to be sharing old logs. So you want a lot of good stuff in those running logs, a lot of good accomplishments, and 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 enjoy it, and then you'll be able to influence others. And right now, you guys are doing a great job by. The next generation of runners see how hard you guys work and some of the great accomplishments that you guys have. And, and that's, that's kind of the trail. That my advice to younger runners is every day you get up, know that you're setting an example for, for the next generation of runners. Appreciate you coming in. And, and uh, even, even some wise words from an excellent athlete to other excellent athletes. That's pretty um, – I appreciate that. Um, the other guest speaker, I'll get him in real quick. Uh, 
is Tony Priel. I'm unmute him. Um, I don't know if he's on, if he can get his uh, video working or not. That's okay. Um, I think you had a question for, for Aaron. Well, he's muted himself. <laughs> Tony is a... Uh, Tony, doesn't Tony doesn't do the technology, man. <laughs> he figured it out a few weeks ago. Uh, I know. Uh, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm on there it. You are, there you are. There you are. Um, Tony is uh, a, a 92 and 96 Olympian, 800, still holds the Tennessee record for the 800, 143, uh, nine. I always, I, I, should, know. I should know that. Um, yeah. I think you had a question for Aaron. Well, Aaron, um, we both came from a very similar background as far as soccer, and I just wanted to see kind of, you know, what the transition was uh, from soccer um, into distance running, because it seems like a lot of distance runners do come, and middle distance runners do come from a soccer background. Yeah. Um, you know, I was playing soccer from, I don't know, maybe age six or seven all the way up until when I quit my freshman year. Uh you know, I think that there's a lot of like aerobic benefit as well as just like dynamic strength that comes from, uh, from soccer. But, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting story. I, I started running cross country and I didn't even actually know what it was until my eighth grade year. And then my brother, Will, who I'm sure some of the people watching uh, know who he is. And he was running at cross country states. And that was the first time that I had ever even witnessed uh, a cross country race. And I decided to, to, uh, pursue cross just to just to stay in shape for soccer and I was still playing competitive and uh, running at the same time which was just exhausting and then um, I think I ran the Wendy's Invitational my freshman year and coach Brian Brown came up to me at lunch and was like hey you're like among the top five or top three or something in the nation among freshmen uh, right now for cross country so uh, quit soccer and that was <laughs> that was kind of the point where I was like all right, fine. So I, I made that tough decision and uh, haven't looked back since. Yeah, I remember the first time I ever saw you race as a region your freshman year and you're out way ahead of all these guys. I was like, who in the world is that? Um, all right, let me move on to um, Ellie. Um, you came from a small school in Vermont. I uh, read that you had a graduating class of around 40. Um, how does someone from a small town become one of the top athletes in the world and the fastest American in the indoor mile? And along those lines, how did you discover running? Um, yeah, well, I, I guess you have to come from somewhere. Um, I'd say that coming from a small town actually probably benefited me more than anything. Um, it just has like a, a great sense of community here. And so I've been supported by everybody here um, throughout my entire running career. Um, you know, I, I think that there's still like quite a bit of runners around my town and um, I'd say like the work ethic that I learned growing up has really helped me become successful in my running. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like all of those things combined, um, you know, obviously it has like things to do with like genetics and um, just like my parents like always had us work really hard on the farm like growing up. So I think that I was always strong from a young age. Um, but just leading into that, like I've had great coaches throughout my career and um, eventually led to the American record. Yeah, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Johnny, along those same lines, um, you're in a bit of a different, you were born into this. Um, <laughs> both your parents excelled. Your, your dad was a two-time Olympian. Your mom yep. made the Olympic trials, I think, twice. Um, so how was it kind of growing up and, and how did they guide you and your siblings into sports in general? Yeah, it was a uh, definitely unique upbringing in the sport. I uh, some of my earliest memories are like pretending to be a cowboy with a starting gun and like wrestling on the high jump mats and stuff like that. Uh, so I didn't really know anything else. I just thought that I thought it was kind of natural. Everyone, I thought running was like this very popular thing that everyone did and everyone's parents and families were somehow involved with. And uh, so it was kind of nice to at least have that level of familiarity and comfort with it all. Um, I think like, I remember, I think my parents telling me about like the heptagonal championships was like the Ivy League championships. And one of my first like things I said when I was little was like, we want heps, we want heps. And I was like telling my friends that and they obviously didn't care or know what that was. So, I mean, 
Yeah, I, but at the same time, I didn't really want to be a pro runner or anything like that, or I didn't want to be a runner at all. I, I thought it was, it was cool and everything, but I'd rather be a baseball player or play soccer like Aaron did or, uh, you know, something like that. And so that's kind of what I, what I aimed for. And thankfully, I'm glad my parents let me sort of find a love for it myself, um, you know, joining the cross country team, just mostly because of the people I knew and my friends that were in school who were on the cross country team who I knew were great guys and my older sister did it and I looked up to her and I wanted to hang out hang out with her and her friends and uh, they didn't push us into it at all or anything like that it was just sort of a natural thing that happened and then of course it it, it worked out that you know I found that I was good at it and that's fun fun to be good at it too so it just all came around pretty organically and I'm really thankful that a love for it was found on my own it was never I was never pushed into it or asked to train at a young age or anything like that I guess I've read, I guess, uh, your brother had some pretty uh, good success as well. Um, oh, yeah. And, and y'all got to race uh, a couple times uh, in USA uniforms, I, I thought, is that what I read? Uh, no. No, no he no. didn't. Or just got to race yeah, with him, though, a little bit. Not. No, no. He was, he was more of a social member of the team. But, oh, uh, social member. Okay. Well, that, just, everybody just, needs, every team needs that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, no, yeah, so, it, it was great. The whole fam loves running and then I you know not just my parents but my grandfather's run 43 marathons and my great aunt competed in the 1934 or 34 or 36 Olympics in Germany oh wow um, oh yeah so we got we got a whole a whole legacy here <laughs> um be- Erica I, I I had read a story um that uh coach of the NC State came to watch you run track and um I guess at first, you hadn't run cross country at all in high school, um, and talk about how that, uh, why that was, and and maybe how did those conversations go with NC State, and maybe other schools as well. So I also came from a soccer background, and up north, soccer is a fall sport, so the same season as cross country. So my freshman and sophomore year of high school, I still played soccer, and then. Um, my freshman soccer coach actually was the head girls indoor and outdoor track coach. And he saw me obviously during our freshman soccer season and was like, Oh, like you, you're pretty good at running. Like you should come out for track. And I laughed him off and blew him off and was like, no, I'm a soccer player. So fast forward. Now it's January. I skipped the first month and a half of track practice because I said I wasn't going to do it. He tracked me down in the hallway. He also happened to be a disciplinarian in charge of in-school suspension, so he's kind of scary. But he asked me one more time to come out for the team, just do a few practices and, like, see if I liked it. And he asked very nicely, so I said yes and found out I was kind of good at it and just stuck with it and quit soccer and started running. But I refused to do cross-country. If I wasn't doing soccer, I was having to fall to myself. Yeah, that wasn't going to work for uh, colleges, I'm sure, for you to just run the, you know, mile and 5K, but don't do cross. Yeah, so um, Coach Hennis and Coach Geiger came up to New Jersey to see me um, work out at, on the track, which was really cool. Like, instead of just a home visit, they actually came to practice to, like, see what we did and, like, how I ran, because I also had nothing else to watch since I didn't do cross country. Um, and as we were walking to the cars after practice, Geiger stops me like dead in my tracks, looks at my Nike shoes and said, you're going to have to wear Adidas and you're going to have to run cross country. And I mean, you don't argue with Geiger. That's true. I know a few other few people who didn't argue with him either. Um, uh, Aaron, uh, your, your, your big race in Farman was obviously a 2018 cross country championships and I, I know for myself and a lot of us at Knoxville are watching that race and seeing you get to the lead with just a thousand to go against uh, what well, probably the hardest NCAA event to win. I think most would agree. Um, uh, talk about how that race went and, and what you were thinking when you decided to take the reins. Yeah. Um, so that was, season was just like a really perfect kind of slow build towards nationals where I kind of was able to build a lot of mental confidence and, and just physical fitness throughout the season. Um, and, you know, sitting on the line at, at cross country nationals, I just knew that I was ready to do what I wanted to do, which was to be top 10. Um, and I think, you know, coming into that last K, 
I was, uh, you know, kind of looked around at one point and kind of counted the guys around me and realized like, oh, wow, I've done what I kind of uh, set out to do. Like I'm, I'm in perfect position now. Um, and we were running down, you know, cause it's at Wisconsin, it's kind of a horseshoe. You run away from the finish, then you, you come back and you circle back towards it. And, um, we were running down and, uh, I saw this bald head of coach Chris Neal, uh, pop out from the crowd and he was super low and he told me to go in it. And I was like, okay. And so that's like when I took off my hat and arm sleeves and gloves, which I kind of got, you know, uh, a little scrutinized for by flow track, um, you know, wondering why I did that, but it, you know, it felt like, uh, taking a, a wet shirt off or something, you know, I just felt like I could breathe. And, uh, I think I got a little antsy a little early and, and I took the lead and we rounded the corner and I kind of got, you know, eaten up by a few of the, the better kickers in the race. But, um, you know, I don't really necessarily regret the move. And, and, uh, you know, that was, I think one of the, one of, one of the be- most special days in my career. I, I don't think I'd be sitting here as a professional athlete if it wasn't for that day, you know, that was kind of, uh, a really um a moment where I can kind of confirm to myself that I knew that I could I could be a professional athlete and um yeah it's a very special day for me. Todd what was your best NCAA championships cross? Me? Yeah. Um I finished sixth as a junior and then I finished eighth as a senior so uh yeah the eighth place was in Knoxville at uh, Pine Lakes Golf Course. Yeah 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 and that was uh that which, which was is now cool. closed by the way. But yeah, that was a tough one for me because I wanted to win on my home course and I trained like a monster during that summer. And I guess the lesson is there. I, I kind of overdid it early and then uh, was running some really fast workouts in September. And I'll never forget when I was training that summer, Glenn Morgan, one of my teammates, who was really re- kind of a pretty relaxed type guy, super talented. But I came in from like a, I hammered like a 12 miler there on the bike trail in Knoxville and I come in, I'm sweating and I'm and it's only June, right? The national championships are in November. And he's like, what are you doing, man? And I said, we're getting ready. And uh, he goes, it's a long time to November. And I, I, we did a 6,400-meter time trial, like, when we got back to school in September. And I ran, like, 18.02. And Glenn was 19.25 or something. And then by November, I only beat him by two seconds at nationals. And he says, got to learn how to relax. What was everyone else's best in CWA cross? Uh, 290th. 290th? Oh, 190th. Oh, 190th. I was so close to being an All-American. <laughs> <laughs> what about Ellie and Erica? Mine was seventh. Seventh. was my um, year, I think. Or fifth. No, that was my senior year before my fifth year. But. What about you, Erica? Uh, my Senior year for cross, I was 17th. 17. 17. Very good. Tony, what was your NCAA cross? <laughs> Mine, um, I never had the chance to line up, um, thank God, because I would have been an embarrassment. But at least they would have known when the race was done. Because that's <laughs> the last person to cross. <laughs> yeah, I would have been the last person by far. By uh, far. Hey, Ellie, um, talk about your record race. Uh, I, I remember watching the race live, and you're, you're battling a very good runner from Germany um, who ran so fast at the beginning of the race. I, you know, everyone probably thought she was going to take it right from the gun. Um, did you ever think about breaking the American record during that race? Um, yeah, so I didn't really think about breaking the record at all before or during the race. Um, I was mostly just thinking about competing. So, like you said, I was racing Klosterhofen, who has an incredible. I didn't want to say it because I'd mess it up. Coco, I think, is what her nickname is. Coco, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I probably said it wrong. I don't know, (laughs) but um, yeah. So she just has an incredible resume, and I've watched her race for the past, you know, couple years, and hadn't really raced her very much um, head to head. But um, definitely a little bit intimidating. Also, like just knowing the field, like Gabriella, somebody that I've raced consistently and um, her teammate as well. And so, you know, I just kind of was following the race plan and that was to get in like second or third, you know, not wanting to lead the race after the rabbit stepped off. And so um, that's pretty much what I did. I was a little bit further back and I don't know, the race just played out in my favor. And um, like, I feel like 
the best decision I made was to give myself a chance, you know, like I definitely could have just been like, wow, like, like Coco's really good. Like, and I could have, you know, like got, let that got in my head. But, um, you know, I think that I got a little bit of confidence just winding down, like passing Gabriella and then, um, you know, just picking it off from there. And then, um, for whatever reason, I had a little bit left in the tank on the last lap, <laughs> but I honestly had no idea what pace I was going. Like I knew it was fast, but I didn't look at the clock and, um, you know, think about splits at all. I just was trying to compete. So I think that that's like how I have my best races. And I, I was, I was looking back, I think bringing back the mile, I had a list of the top, top women in, in the mile. And I think four Americans, um, uh, in the top 10 came from that race it was just stacked from top to bottom yeah um, right. yeah you know so um johnny I, I was reading about you having an opportunity to go to the olympic trials back when you were in high school with your dad and um was this your first kind of up close olympic experience since he had competed prior uh, done his olympics before you were born um how did that and, and how did that kind of motivate you going to the end of your high school and, and moving on to college yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, so my dad had made the 1980 uh, Olympic team and they didn't go cause it was boycotted um, by the U S. So as a, you know, it was the first time they were having the trials in Eugene since then, I think, and they were ha inviting all those, all those people back um, for 2008. So my dad had a, could bring a plus one. So my mom said to take me just so I could see what it was all about. And, you know, at that point I was like still thinking I was like going to be a baseball player. So uh, he wanted, I think they wanted me to see the sport at its, at its best, and it definitely worked. I, mean, I was blown away. Obviously, Eugene, such an amazing place, especially for track and the Olympic trials, such an electric meet. Um, so just seeing all the amazing performances that day, I was there when, like, Andrew Reading and that, you know, those guys dove at the line in the 800 in that amazing race, and that was, like, the craziest thing I'd ever seen live in my life and the loudest I'd ever heard a stadium. You know, I'd been to – plenty of Red Sox games and stuff, but nothing topped like the stadium feel when they're in that 800. And um, so it, from then on, it was pure love. And I was like, all right, I, I'd love to be at this level. And I, I didn't think I was at that moment, like I'm going to be a pro runner, but I definitely thought uh, I'll definitely be an Olympian. <laughs> so I did, I put that before the pro running thing in my mind. And I, uh, it was, yeah, so since then, it was just a love at, love at first Olympic trials, and, and then I got to go back there eight years later, and I was racing some of those guys that I was racing Andrew Reading in my prelim of the 1500, and it was pretty surreal and, and exciting, and seeing a lot of those same faces that I had seen and met back in 2008, and, you know, all these amazing people in this sport who are still there, and still, you know, guys who go to the trials every year and stuff like that, so it's just an amazing community to be a part of, and that was just a a great a great place to start yeah i remember i remember that race that was a crazy yeah. one and oh, yeah. I, mean, I, think had, I think you had a crazy last uh last 100 meters a year 92 olympic trials <laughs> to get on the team as well um he kind of had an exciting finish as well if you've not watched that one i recommend it um uh erica you seem to have found success in the longer distances so far um and, and Maybe you disagree. Maybe you feel like you're more of a, a 1500 person or whatever. But um, growing up, what was your favorite event, and how has that changed? Is, has that changed at all as a professional athlete? Um, I would say I didn't have a favorite event. I don't really think I do now. When I first started track, we literally started with a 200. My very first track race ever was indoors, wearing a pair of boys' bikes that was two sizes too big and a 200 meter. And it was okay, but it wasn't great. So my coaches just kept bumping me up an event until I like placed higher. And in high school, the highest you can go is 3,200. And that's where I found the most success. And then I went on to college and then the next event up would be 5k. So then we went up to that. I found success there. And for me, like I enjoy being good at things. So as I got better at the event, I guess it became more of my favorite event. And then I had Gate River in 2019 and had this great 15K, but I don't really want to say it's my favorite event because it's kind of long. Um, so I would say my favorite event is just like running, but I don't know. That's kind of a cop out. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, 
you, you found success uh, at you know different levels. So um, you know, I think you'll you'll settle in. Do you kind of know where you want to go with twenty twenty one? Um, I think it's nice that we have some extra time now because we really hadn't committed to 5k, 10k or like which one of the two. Um, ideally I would race both and just see kind of where the training took us and what I felt most confident in. And now that we have an extra year, we'll find out in like eight months. All right. Um, and real quick before we move on, um, uh, does anyone want to speak to kind of how everything's, played out the past few months. Of course, our athletes are going through it as well in Knoxville and, and even us as a, as a staff having to handle uh, everything with COVID-19. And, um, you know, obviously we don't have Olympics on the line, but, um, you know, how, how have y'all kind of handled the, this change and, and maybe even talk about how your, how your training has been adjusted? You know, it's, that's for anyone. I know here, uh, out here in Boulder, for us, we've sort of, tried to change our mindset from, you know, just the, okay, we, you know, now we just have to race next year to kind of thinking of this as an opportunity to, to build on, on some, some weak points. You know, we've been working with our strength coach for the specifically to, to target weak areas and make sure that, that we're really ready to handle that um, and really benefit from it the most. Um, you know, I think that's probably just the, the biggest thing that we've been focusing on is just making sure that we take our rest days well, stay healthy, and, and, and build on those weaknesses. Anyone else uh, want to hop that on that one? Yeah, absolutely. We uh, obviously doing a lot of training alone is tough and whatnot. And I think that, again, staying healthy is just so important. It's so hard to, you know, see any sort of medical professionals or anything. Um, so you just got, it's going back to the basics really. And just learning how to like, just like when, you, when we just started out running, we weren't seeing massage therapists and stuff. It was just getting out there, hitting the trails and, uh, you know, stretching, foam rolling and that sort of thing. And just putting in good mileage. And, uh, we all know that when running comes back a lot, like a lot of other things, it's going to be so special and everyone's going to be so excited and ready to come back together that it's, you don't want to miss out on that. So. I think we're just kind of, I'm just keeping that day in mind and that's kind of motivating me on a daily basis. Uh, yeah. Oh, I just think that like everybody's kind of like in a different like, like scenario. I feel like some people are still like able to run with a couple, you know, like teammates and stuff. Like for me, like it's been kind of nice to spend time like at home, like with my fiance in Vermont and, you know, just get quality time, like, in the place that I love so like it's kind of like a bittersweet type thing right now but like I think like there's obviously like a lot of emotions that I could talk about but um you know just like what Johnny was saying like getting back to your basics and just you know kind of getting creative with the resources that you have has been you know like the main focus right now and uh I think I, the, the older gentleman here uh could probably speak to I think it's you're probably thankful for the time to rest and and um if you if you are taking the time to rest and um recovering from any nagging injuries and things like that um because uh, i would say probably those two didn't have much of that opportunity in the period of time they're professionals and uh probably had to grind through some stuff never had that time to just take a break reset um and of course you don't have a lot of time to do that you're building for something that's not that far in the future but um you're probably thankful for that time you got right now, I'd say. Um, so, uh, Aaron, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, Aaron. Uh, I, <laughs> I think I knew this, but I guess I, I didn't remember it, that you, you had a little bit of difficulty at McAlpine Park in North Carolina. You ran 1454 three times in a row without breaking it. Never could PR past 1454. Um, what were your thoughts after that third time? and kind of what helped you finally break the mark later at Full Locker South, where you broke it by a lot and won um, the race. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the first time that I broke 15 was at McAlpine, um, 1454 at Wendy's, and that was kind of uh, a moment where I realized, okay, I can definitely make Foot Locker this year. You know, then regionals, I think you're so caught up in just racing bodies that you don't even think about time. And at that point, I was like, oh, cool, I just ran the same time twice. That's, that's interesting. 
Um, and then the third time, uh, Wendy's Invitational again, and I was actually trying to run away the entire race from one of Erica's teammates, uh, college teammates, Patrick Sheehan. Um, and, you know, he was just hawking me the entire race, and I was barely able to get away from him. Um, and I think, yeah, when I saw my time, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. I cannot believe I ran 1454.0 again. Um, but, you know, I knew that as the season progressed that I was gaining fitness. And when I showed up to Foot Locker South, the, the fourth or the, yeah, for the, I guess, fourth year in a row, then I really was trying to chase after Sean McGordy's course record there that, that time around. Um, and I think that just that mindset of going in of I am not racing to win, I'm racing for 100% of the time, you know, which I obviously, you know, you show up to Foot Locker South, you're, you're clearly trying to make the team again. But, uh, you know, it was, it was definitely a, uh, it was, it was a moment of, okay, when the gun went off, I was chasing a time and I knew that if I accomplished that goal, I would go regardless. Um, so yeah, so I chased that and it was, it was, uh, uh McAlpine is just a special place. It's a, it's a really cool course, you know, it's steeped in history from everyone that's ever run Foot Locker South. So yeah, I think that was a, that was a very kind of fun time to go and try to break that time finally. Um, and uh, all right, and moving on to Ellie, you chose the University of New Hampshire to go to school. You're from Vermont. Um, were you, and, and you have very good um, stats. I think you're 17th at Nike, is that right? Um, uh, but- uh, 11th, I don't remember. 11th, some, I don't know, something like that. Um, yeah. it, were you recruited to a lot of big schools and why did uh, UNH end up being the perfect spot for you to develop into this professional athlete now? Um, yeah, I, I got a lot of letters in the mail. Um, I think a lot of coaches reached out and honestly, I think I was kind of naive about like the whole running like scene in college. Like I, you know, like came from a small school, like we talked about, but, um, you know, like didn't like, I don't know. Like I, I just went with my gut. Like I, I visited some schools, like I had it narrowed down. Um, you know, I, I looked at Cornell and Dartmouth and, UVM and you know some other schools but when I visited UNH like I just felt the most comfortable um you know I think I it was just similar to like what I was used to like here kind of but like still like a little bit of different like distance away so it was like three or four hours away like I could get home on a weekend if I needed to you know it was kind of a big deal for me to like go away to school like just like I had never left home I know like that's the case for a lot of people, but I'm just very connected to home. And so um, I felt the most comfortable at UNH and I really liked Hop, like and everything he had to say about, you know, like the family that was the cross country team and how he took care of his athletes. And really what did it for me was meeting the girls and um, hitting it off with them. And so, you know, he just brought me along slowly and, you know, he didn't take advantage of, um, my talent in any way, you know, like he built up my mileage every year. And um, I guess that's why it was the perfect fit. All right. Um, Johnny, uh, you graduated from, you went to Columbia, but you graduated from grad school from Oregon. Um, what do you think it's going to mean for you to go to the Olympic trials next th summer, most notably in that brand new uh, Coliseum? It's not even a track. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, uh, from what I've seen, that track looks beautiful and amazing. I mean, it's not, obviously we miss Hayward Field, but it's the people in the place, not the place that make it the meet. So it's going to be uh, just as electric as it was back when I went, when I was younger or in 2016, I'm, I'm sure. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. And, and a lot of good people in that town and uh, the community, you know, it, it's a highly debated issue of, where meets should be and the distribution of national championships and that sort of thing. But man, at Hayward field, it, the place is really popping. So uh, I'm excited. I'm excited to go back there and uh, hopefully do the uh, Oregon duck faithful proud and come away with an Olympic spot. Do you, uh, Todd or Tony, do you prefer uh, Oregon or Louisiana for Olympic trials? <laughs> <laughs> I loved Eugene. I loved racing there. New Orleans in 92 was like 90 degrees and 90% humidity. And we had to run a prelim in the Olympic trials for the, for the 10K. 10K. Yeah. 
in, in 1992, we, we ran a prelim to eliminate one person. <laughs> yeah. yeah it happened. I'm, I am the, I'm the minority by far. I absolutely did not like to run in Eugene. I did not. And I think that to build the sport, to grow the sport, I think that you should put it in different areas. So, you know, people that can't afford to go to Eugene can go and have that one time that they get to see, you know, um, you know I mean, you know, a Christian Coleman run and Todd Williams run or, you know, everybody that they can. I'm, I just think that it should be spread more. I understand the whole thing with, you know, Eugene and, the history and all that, but um, for the 800, I personally like running in the warmer weather, like, um, you know, New Orleans, but, you know, for the 10K, I absolutely see it. So, you know, just being the minority, having a different view is, you know, be all right. Tony, Tony, didn't we have, didn't we have a place <laughs> hey, Tony, didn't, Tony, didn't we have a pretty good party in 91, though? And you think? <laughs> we, we did, we did, but, you know, yeah, we did. Okay, good. As long as you remember, um, as long, it was 30 years ago, but we had a good party after we won the national championship there. That was fun. We did, and, you know, I've been to pre, and I've, you know, run out there before. I just like for the championships to be for all of the U.S. That's just me. That's just me. Um, uh, Erica, talk about uh, transitioning from college to pro. I, I was – uh, watching a couple of interviews and it seems like you kind of debated whether or not you just, you were going to turn pro out of NC state and um, what ended up making you think that you ought to make this professional career? Um, I would say it happened pretty organically. I didn't really think too much about it. I figured if I just focused on my NCAA career and just had a lot of fun with it and got everything out of it that I could, that maybe I would have the opportunity and then when I finished up with college and the opportunity presented itself to move up to Boston and run with CAA, I took a visit. It was like super similar to the college recruiting system where like coaches reached out and then you talk to some people involved, you talk to a couple sponsors and then you like literally visit the city the same way you would for college. And when I came up to Boston, it was just kind of refreshing and it was nice after having gone down south for college to be back in the northeast I'm originally from New Jersey and North Carolina was a wonderful change but I prefer like the fast pace and like kind of aggressiveness of the northeast and it was just a really cool opportunity to live in a big city and I really enjoyed the team that was here and the team environment that we had it's obviously much smaller than a college roster it's just a handful of athletes but it is a very tight knit team and you do a lot together and everything just kind of clicks for me. Are you and Ellie ever run into each other? Do y'all ever, you know, you're both in Boston training uh, not right now, but, but uh, y'all ever run into each other? Oh well, yeah. yeah. Um, our coaches are friends and a couple of our teammates are actually roommates. So there's a lot of communication between our two teams and we see each other, even in Flagstaff when we weren't in Boston, we saw each other yeah. all the time. <laughs> kind of nice to like work out with other like groups around Boston like especially BAA and you know like all of us can work off of each other it's pretty unique that's pretty cool yeah um Aaron this one's a little bit more local um because a lot of people still remember when you're here running it wasn't that long ago but remember you when you're running really fast times and um uh, you know, like at our two mile time trial, was a big one for you, Cherokee Boulevard, Victor Ash. Um, kind of what's your favorite memory of racing in Knoxville? Yeah, um, I don't know. I think uh, running in, you know, I'm sure in this goes for any athlete, you know, that goes through high school, just consistency of like competitors was always fun. And, and um, you know, when when you're running the can the same courses over and over again or the, or at the same meets, then you kind of can you can chase records and stuff and that's always fun. Um but if I had to pick a favorite race in Knoxville, I think the two mile time trial. And I think it was just because I got so much out of it. Um when I ran those time trials, then I just knew that that was like the final confidence check of like, okay, 
when I go to Foot Locker South in a couple of weeks, I know I'm ready to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to go qualify for that team. Um, and so, yeah, both of those times uh, were great. And, and to be able to set, like, I, I think I said the Tennessee State soil record my senior year, yeah, which was yeah, great. Until, um, and and to still have yeah. stadium record and record and everything. Yeah. What? So, you may, yeah, it was, what? It was, you, you may it was still great. have the, the, the record on soil, right? I think Brody did it out of, yeah, out of okay, state. Okay. Yeah. He did it in New York, I think. Um, okay. Uh, Ellie, um, you're running for New Balance Boston. Um, you're training under Mark Coogan, uh, which a couple other guys on here may know very well. Uh, what attracted you to Boston and uh, particularly New Balance Boston? Um, well, I definitely am an East Coast girl, so that kind of narrowed down my options. Um, you know, uh, I just really liked the team, like similar to how I picked UNH. <laughs> Sorry, my dog. Um, um, so my coach actually in college was good, or is good <laughs> friends with my current coach right now, Mark. So that already like kind of got my foot in the door. Like I had seen Mark around like some of the meets, um, you know, in Boston and I'm just familiar with the area and, um, you know, I have a lot of um, UNH alum, like teammates who are still in the area. So it was kind of like an easy choice to stay, but um, honestly, New Balance is, um, oops, sorry. <laughs> She's like, sorry. <laughs> um, That's the new world we live in now. Okay. Um, anyways, my teammates are the best. Um, we just all get along really well. And so I'm just feeling really fortunate um, to have them and, you know, like have like a mix of different, um, you know, like girls like doing different events. So like, like me and Katrina are kind of doing like longer stuff, but then we can like jump in the fast stuff with like Shifra and, and Leanne and Heather. So, um, you know, it just works really well. And I'm really happy with my decision. Um, yeah, Matt said I had to get some uh, sponsor questions in there and stuff. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Johnny, moving on to you. Uh, talk about the day you ran 349. You became the seventh person um, to break 350 ever and um, the second fastest in the indoor mile of all time. Uh, and, and one little fact, many people probably forget, I don't, you didn't even win that race. That was a crazy race. Um, well, the winner was the world record. So. Yeah, the world record was in your same race. Did you ever see that mark happening, breaking 350, um, or was it a big shock to you when you did it? Um, well, I definitely never – it wasn't going into that race yet with the intention of running under 350. I, I just knew, you know, like Todd said, when you get an opportunity, you got you to gotta seize it. And I, I knew that that day was going to be a, a great opportunity. I was in great shape. Um, you know, I was mentally – ready to go and the race was setting up and it was kind of a perfect storm coming together. And so I just got in there and much like Ellie and her, in her awesome race this past winter, I was just in, out there competing and just uh, trying to stay relaxed and beat guys. And I, it was all just sort of a blur. I was just out there competing to my best. I was confident because I had worked so hard and knew I was in great shape. I had a little bit of fire in my belly because I had just been out kicked by the old flying mullet Craig angles a week before. And I, uh, in New Jersey at the U S champs. So I was, I was excited and ready to, ready to rip. And uh, I think that when those things come together and it's a, a good opportunity, um, you're going to run, you run really fast. And yeah, I did. Uh, I did get second in the race, uh, but I was running them down. Give me another 50 meters. I would have had them. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully you get your chance to that Boston track has produced some ridiculous okay. times over the years. Mm -hmm. um, man. Um, Erica, many feel like uh, once you go pro, it's an entirely individual sport, but what attracted you to Team BAA in Boston and maybe that team feel that you, that you had in college? Um, I think kind of what Ellie and I have already mentioned, Boston is like such a special place for running and there are so many teams and even the non-professional teams, it has a huge running community and everyone's like, not just like nice to each other, but like genuinely it's like one big Boston team. Like there's always someone to run with. Everyone talks to each other. Everyone cheers for each other, even if they might have different sponsors or they're running for different teams and just having that 
um, coming from college and then moving somewhere that had such a big running community, like supporting you and cheering for you and having that many people to run with um, really made that transition easy. All right. And uh, Aaron, talk about uh, your decision to run professionally and what, what made you choose 10 men over? I'm sure you looked at some other places. I think I was reading that uh, some other places are offering you money and you decide to not take the money and go around with 10 men. Yeah. You know, I, I visited other places and everything and, and, you know, there was, there was a lot of amazing opportunities that were on the table for me. But um, when I came out on a visit to 10 man, uh, there was just this uh, very big team mentality that I really loved. And I kind of wanted to find that team mentality outside of um, outside of, of college. And it's not that the other places that I visit didn't have that, but it was, it just felt more acute here. And, and, uh, it just felt like the right spot where everyone was really caring for each other and actually genuinely wanted the other people to, in the team to succeed. And um, there was this really kind of a big all in attitude. Um, it's funny the way that I actually kind of joined the team was, is that the last night of my visit, I, I told uh, Drew and, and Sam, Hey, I'm going to come out. I'm going to join the team. And I flew home and I think I twiddled my thumbs for about a day and then sold my car, packed up a Penske truck and just moved even with no house or anything in mind. It was just like, I'm just going to go. Um, and, you know, I think that was just like, that's kind of the similar story for all the guys here. And, and um, yeah, I just really enjoyed the process. And in terms of going pro from, from college, I, I, I also think I was a little bit irresponsible in that decision of I never, after like my senior year of college, I don't think I ever even considered like, Oh yeah, I'm just going to go get a job after college. Like I just, assumed I was going to go pro and I had kind of this blind faith in myself and um, you know, it ended up working out luckily, but yeah, it was uh, definitely an interesting transition for sure. You make some poor decisions. A uh, side question. Uh, the other big poor decision I've read about was your decision to get a tattoo the night before the 2018 NCAA cross country championships. Do you have any other good advice for before the race uh, for athletes? <laughs> hey, you know, sometimes you just got to get a tattoo 12 hours before your, your biggest race of your life. Um, yeah, no, I think I, I always try to, you know, people deal with, with pre-race nerves in different ways and everything. And I just like, I just always advise younger runners that, that you have to do what makes you comfortable. You know, you're, you don't do anything crazy special before workouts or anything like that. And if you start to kind of create this um, routine that is, that is too specific and, and too, you know, involved and that falls apart in some way, then, then you, you start to, you start to kind of lose touch as yourself as a human, which makes you lose touch of yourself as an athlete. And, and uh, so, you know, if, if there's something that you do that makes you comfortable, go do it. You know, I think that's, that's the thing is, is if you're, if you're a happy person, you're going to be a happy athlete. And, and uh, I think that's, that's my advice and it happened that that night that I wanted a tattoo and that's, that's what happened. Um, Todd and Tony real quick, y'all, y'all came from a different era where the, the team, training aspect wasn't as popular I don't think um did y'all ever have teams to run with outside of training here at Tennessee I like to say you know I, I love sticking to my routine so I never wanted to leave the track I think I started you know I started going to practice in 1987 in September and I, I kept the same routine till 2003 you know so I do my morning runs at 6 30 a.m I do my evening sessions at 3 p.m I do my weights at 4.30. I go to the, you know, I was, I was like clockwork. And that's the reason I, 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 even if there was groups, I probably would have stuck with what I like doing day in and day out. Um, and so, you know, I would go up and train periodically with Bob Kennedy up at uh, IU where he lived in Bloomington. Or we would go, you know, in London, we had a place, we stayed in London for a couple summers where we trained in the, well, not just the summer, but the winter. So I got a little taste of training with groups, but I just loved being by myself and kind of just hanging with George and the team. And, you know, I, I was pretty much part of the University of Tennessee team from 1987 until 2003, you know, so I had, I, I had a lot of great memories. So I'm glad I did what I did. Yeah. No, um, for me, it was, uh, I was, I was pretty much a psycho on the track. So there was, there weren't too many people that were going to be doing the things that I was doing. Um, I was, I was really good friends with Mark Everett and Johnny Gray. So, 
so we would talk and Mark and I are still really, really good friends, uh, talk almost every single day. Um, so I didn't have a lot of people that could do what we were doing on the track. I didn't go train with Mark. I definitely didn't go out West to go train with, um, you know, with Johnny Gray, but we just didn't really have that option, you know? And I think that uh, if I did have that option, you know, I might've stayed in, in the game a little longer because you have somebody there with a little bit of like checks and balances going, Hey, you know, you're going a little bit too slow on your recovery day or you're going a little bit too fast in your recovery day or, you know, let's just go over and do some med balls instead of, you know, Olympic lifts. I mean, so, so I love, I love the concept of a team, you know, um, and I think that there is that they have a lot of advantages now, you know, in those teams. Um, so let's go. Yeah. And, uh, Johnny, I'll jump to you real quick just on that same line. Uh, you went to college on both coasts uh, in New York City and, and also in Oregon. Did you like the big city life or the rural life better? And um, what made you decide to move back east eventually to New Jersey, New, Jersey, New York Track Club? And yeah. Um, yeah, I think it, it was all a pretty natural progression of where I was at as a runner and uh, as a person. I think that uh, going to the city for my undergraduate at Columbia was, uh, you know, the, the team there and the people there were amazing and it was a, a great fit and I knew it was a great school. So I uh, was excited to go to the city and it's such a, you know, a bustling place and there's so much going on. And, you know, I think I really matured a lot living there and meeting people from all sorts of walks of life. And then as I got more serious about running, uh, the opportunity to run for Oregon came up and obviously that's a, a very storied program and all that. And, so I, I took up uh, Andy Powell, the, the coach there at the time, on the offer and went out there to graduate school. And that, again, I was just trying to see what else I could do in the sport, what else I could do in running. I thought I hadn't gotten the best out of myself. So the rural life out there was, you know, the co small college town feel is also awesome. And I really enjoyed it. And I, at Columbia, I didn't really have the opportunity to have like a powerhouse football team or an athletic department that was so uh, close knit and you know supportive of each other so that was uh, a nice shift and a great exactly what I needed at the time as I started to you know improve as a as a runner and th at that point I was starting to do better in races and that sort of thing and then I wanted to keep it going after my time there and uh, coach Frank Gagliano reached out to me I'm an east coast man much like Ellie's an east coast woman I uh, just and Erica. And, Erica. and Erica yeah and I wanted to head back that direction and uh and yeah, Dags hit me up and, and wanted me to come out there. And I, again, I, I knew there was more I could get out of myself. And I think at any level of the sport, if you want to improve, uh, there's always going to be opportunities. There's always going to be people you can run with. And I was lucky to have a, a team and it's a huge advantage. Uh, you're right to have a team to train with professionally in the same way. It's an advantage undergraduate. You know, you have these people that you care about and care about you and you're invested in each other and you advise each other. And so it's, it's all just been a great uh, natural progression, and I'm, I'm really happy to be where I am now. Thank you for it. All right. Um, real quick, just some light questions, uh, and then we'll let you all go on with the rest of your day. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, Aaron, um, so I read that uh, right now you're uh, working at a is it nutrition store. Yeah. Um, working uh, unpacking boxes and things so what's your favorite tool unpacking a box uh i mean i guess uh, i guess uh, like the, the a nice new exacto blade there's nothing like it you know you can really you can really get in there quick <laughs> <laughs> okay um ellie a couple for you um many have, have written about and, and maybe our people don't know that much uh about you're growing up, but talk about um, growing up on a farm, milking cows at 5 a.m. And uh, what's your least favorite job, most favorite job on a farm? Oh, um, so actually I was talking about this, like with my fiance, I'd say my favorite job is trucking cows. And I feel like I can't like talk like farm talk right now, but just like hauling cows, like you have to move them from barn to barn. So like, I don't know. I always like kind of want to be a trucker. So that's kind of a fun job. <laughs> Um, my least favorite job is probably just shoveling manure. Um, but, excuse my language, I almost slept there. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> and uh, my other my other one for you, I was reading about how your fiance 
had given you a cow and what he proposed to you? Um, and where does the cow live in Boston? Yeah. Yeah, we keep her in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. She stays, she stays in Vermont. She's um, on my parents' farm. But I've been able to spend a little bit of time with her with everything that's going on. So <laughs> what's the name? What's the cow's name? Oh, she's got like three names. So her father's name is Tequila. So we named her Rita because like Margarita, but my sister likes to call her Jose. <laughs> so. uh, well, I think you should change it to Rona. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, Johnny, for you, um, you're, we had talked about this before we got on. Um, you and your father are the fastest father-son duo in the mile. And, and in fact, that you're also the fastest family with your mother um, in, in history. Only 12 pairs have ever done sub four miles or average sub four miles, um, including Darren Brown, who lived here for a short time, um, the Centrowitz, Kinos, Coughlin. Um, what does it mean to be at the top of that, such a prestigious list of, of, of names? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's it means it means a ton. I you know I grew up, but uh, again, like we said, in I grew up in the sport and grew up looking up to my father and uh, hearing so many so much about his accomplishments and all the crazy things he did in road races and track races. And I think that just getting to be a part of that legacy and you know his legacy and my my own career kind of linking up and me adding to that story and. Uh, and just to the, you know, it's nice to be a part of any tradition in any family, whatever it is, uh, whether it's, you know, working the family farm or whatever, it's, it's just nice to be, to be a part of something bigger within your family and it brings you closer and, uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful for it. And I'm sure all those other father and son duos are, are just as happy about it too, but there can only be one at the top. Now you ran faster than your dad, so you get to sit at the head of the table now? <laughs> <laughs> not, not quite no i still have to you know go mow the lawn and all that all right. um and i think finally for uh you erica boston marathon is supposed to be this past week um many from knoxville adults have run boston um have you been able to experience that yet boston marathon weekend and if so have you have a favorite part about it uh, yeah, last year. So this jacket is actually from um, last year's marathon collection. So that was my first year living in Boston and my first firsthand Boston marathon experience. And it was just unlike anything I'd ever been a part of. Um, my apartment is right by mile 24. So we watch the professionals finish at the grandstands and then everything's closed, the streets, the subways, everything. So I just went ahead and like walked home and just seeing the thousands and thousands of people both running and cheering all day. Like I got home around 3 PM and there were still just hundreds of people in my neighborhood out on the street cheering. And it was just an unreal atmosphere. So I think just seeing how many people really come out and just, it's such a long weekend since it's the marathons on Monday. So you really get that like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of just building that anticipation. So Marathon Monday is just like unlike anything else. And uh, I hope this isn't too big of a question. Does anyone have any advice for um, any of our young athletes to um, kind of give them advice on how, to, you know, they're all started where you did, right? From, from your first step. Everyone had that same first step. Um, and talk about, if you could, if anyone wants to jump in here, how um, uh, they can either set their goals for a high level um, or, you know, how they can turn their vision to eventually being in your footsteps of being a professional athlete. Not all at once. That's okay. <laughs> I'd, um, I'd say just like, you know, take it as it goes. Like, I think it's really important to develop, you know, at your own pace. And so like not, like, you know, obviously having goals, but um, I think it's important to have big goals and smaller goals. So, like, take it kind of day by day, month by month, season by season, um, and build into becoming the ath the best athlete that you can. Yeah, I agree with Ali. I think keeping the journals. Yeah, I'd say. When you, in terms of, uh, like Todd said, too, it's cool to have stuff to look back on, see how much you've improved. And you can also write down your small, smaller and bigger goals throughout the process and uh, see how you're improving. And it's a lot of fun. And again, it's a nice thing that you can have when, when you're older. 
Yeah, I would say I that like when you create goals, just create like attainable goals from season to season, but then don't be afraid to dream big for, for the long run. Um, and, you know, just stack consistent weeks of training and stay healthy. That's the biggest thing is, is go slow, stay healthy, slowly build, because you'd much rather have a long, consistent build than have to try to bounce back and forth. And I think Todd and Aaron touched on it earlier as far as just like you are your biggest competition and you know how much work you've put in. So you just need to remember that every athlete's different. Every athlete's going to have their own timeline, their own best days, their own worst days. So just really worry about your days and challenging yourself. Any, uh, any shout outs you need uh, to, to hand out to anybody? Um, anything else you want to say before we head out? Hi, nope. Mom. Hi, Mom. Yeah, yeah. Wendy, I'm sure, is, is watching. I'm sure she's not. She'll watch it later. Huh? <laughs> oh, oh. Um, see, I forgot to. Well, that's all right. I'll ask you another time. I was going to ask, uh, you know, you and you and well okay I'll ask it anyway you and Will um Aaron held the state record for four years um or sorry the state title in the Templeton household for four years um who who has the bragging rights though between you two uh well I mean you know not to toot the own horn but I think I think me uh you know just just uh you know, I think um, I've had a little bit longer of a career, maybe a little bit more success here and there. And, uh, you know, I was third my freshman year. I was, I was jumping at his heels, and I, I did beat him in our last race together. So, you know, I think I'm going to give myself the bragging rights. All right. Well, on that note, I guess I'll let you all go. It was, it was really um... – Really great to meet you all, uh, the ones I haven't met before. I appreciate you taking an, uh, a little more than an hour out of your day to join us. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll get this up on YouTube for other people that weren't able to tune in to go back and watch, and hopefully they can glean some some interesting uh, information, not only about you as, as you guys as we move into these next 12 months and hopefully cheer on all y'all at the Olympic trials in, in Eugene, but um, also learn about y'all personally. Um, I, I always felt that knowing an athlete makes you more um, attached to them, whether or not they are at the front of the race or uh, battling for an Olympic trial spot. I think it's, I'm more interested in watching y'all now and meeting you than, I, than um, you know, an athlete I, ha I don't know. So I um, hope other athletes take that opportunity to go back and watch and, and learn some stuff from y'all. I appreciate y'all. Good luck with the rest of your uh, uh, quarantine period. I hope y'all can get back to training real soon and, and be successful here um, in a few months. So have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, Tony, appreciate y'all so hopping in. Um, so great job, everyone. Have a good week. All right. You too.